Hello, welcome to this, the latest episode of the How Long to Beat podcast. With me, Rick, as always, are Alex and Paola. And this time, for the second time of the season, we have a special guest. His family and friends know as Ian. I know him as the cretin who gave 13 Sentinels a 9 out of 10. But you on the forums will know him as Let's Talk About June. Let's welcome June. Hello, how are you? Hello, How dare my friend. You give it Actually, a nine. <laughs> I was like, did I give it a nine or did I even give it an eight? I have my completions up on the right. You're right. It, I did give it a nine. Yeah, it's, you wouldn't you wouldn't be here if it was an eight. We you just Ooh. got it. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, hey, thanks so much for having me on. I've been uh, looking forward to this for a while. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, we're excited. So we'll do the the basic thing like we did uh, with our last guest. I'm just going to run through a couple little questions so we can get to know a little bit more about you. So why don't we start with um, what part of the world do you live in and how has that affected your gaming life? Yeah, um, I may rephrase the my answer a little bit because I think it's maybe more impactful to my gaming career. But uh, mm. I currently live in Arizona. And as some of you may know, I'm going to be making some moves uh, up to the Pacific Northwest soon. Gonna gonna move to Oregon after getting a new job. But gaming wise, you know, um, I think what imp- what impacted me most was when I was younger, when uh, technology wasn't as prevalent. There was no internet. You know, I was growing up in the late '80s, early '90s, in a really small town in South Louisiana, and um, not exactly a hub for all things gaming, especially at the time. Um, and, you know, down there, it's uh, it's pretty country. It's pretty, you know, outdoorsy in the sense of, like, hunting and fishing and mudding, which is when you get in your truck and, like, try to drive through mud, really deep mud. Um, but I really wasn't into that stuff. I was more of an inside guy, more of a music guy, and, and loved my games. So uh, I was a little bit isolated. I didn't really have a, a bunch of friends or, like, community around that as kids you know there wasn't like the the playground talk about you know super mario world like there might have been elsewhere um but yeah so that's kind of one way it affected my gaming i think another thing is uh regionally you know what was popular there was very much nintendo um you know i had an nes it was my first ever console and then i had an snes and that was like I never even questioned, do I get a Genesis? I didn't even know about a Master System until much, much later. And anything else, you know, just I didn't know about. It wasn't in my in my realm. I didn't see it at the at the game store or at or at the Sears or the shopping malls, you know, where I could get game stuff. So um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Um, I know. Right. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just gonna say I relate heavily to to your story because I grew up in like very small town Canada, which is like like basically the boonies of uh, <laughs> and like mudded and like fishing, hunting, all that stuff. That was just like what everyone was into. And I was a little kid who was yeah. like, "Well, why don't we go in and play Mario on your nest?" And they're like, "Nah, dude, come on, let's no. go outside." And I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> yeah, I didn't really feel very very at home there. Uh, and actually, I was excited to move out to college and get to a big city or a bigger city as soon as I could. And, and life's been good since then. So not knocking Louisiana, just not for me. Um, hmm. But actually, so these days, you know, a big thing is how do you buy your games? Where do you buy your games? Um, and, you know, I was mainly just kind of doing PC digital mostly uh, for the last few years. But last year with COVID and just <clears throat> getting a bit of the the bug and finally wanting to bite and finally get myself a switch to kind of get up in the the most recent generation, I got a switch and I just got kind of the collector's bug. So I've been doing all physical, um, dealing with the damn limited run companies and eBay. And then, you know, for, for new stuff that gets a broad release, I'm all about Best Buy because, uh, well, first off, I used to work at Best Buy for several years where I was in, well, I was in school. So I'm a little bit, you know, bias got a <laughs> somewhat soft place in my heart, like some crappy memories too of Black Friday and whatever, but you know, they treated me well. And uh, they actually have treated their employees really well, especially during the COVID pandemic, um, when it was early days and a lot of places were mandated to close, they kept paying their employees and giving them benefits, which I think is awesome. And uh, I like to keep supporting them because of that. That is awesome. Nice. Um, so I guess you, you you talked about this a tiny bit, like, you know, growing up with the NES and the SNES and, and all that, but what's your kind of 
gaming background or, or maybe even more your preference these days? Yeah, um, it's definitely evolved over the years. These days, I really love uh, deep single player experiences. I don't really have a lot of patience for too much multiplayer, except for maybe the odd game of uh, Rocket League with with some friends or maybe some Smash Brothers. But uh, yeah, I'm mostly single player and that really ties in well with how long to beat and just getting those completions, talking about games beat with the community. Um, and actually those two things have have not been in a vacuum. Like those very much are related, how I got more into single player games and how I found how long to beat and started you know, interacting more with, with those type of games. But as for the genres themselves, I uh, really like RPGs all the different types from, you know, the kind of more Western CRPG style to JRPGs. And I really like platformers, especially Metroidvanias. I think it's fair to say that Super Metroid is probably my favorite game of all time. Although I don't think it's my Desert Island game because you can beat it in like an hour and a half, <laughs> even if you're not speed running. So probably want to pick something more beefy from my Desert Island. Um, and also I've been getting more into narrative games. And what I mean by that is... Um, Games with not so, so much gameplay, just emphasis on the story, and that can take a lot of different forms, but um, think like the Telltale Games mm -hmm. series, or think, you know, games that would be considered adventure games, or even like more kind of walking simulator type games, anything where really a good, strong narrative is, is heavy as the main uh, element. Um, I like all kind of other stuff too. I mean, I don't really <laughs> discriminate, but, you know, mostly single player um, you know, I was growing up, it was all like arcade type games, like arcade style platformers or shooters, uh, some sports games now and then. But, you know, most genres I, I tend to enjoy. Hmm. I feel like I'm like seeing a, um, <laughs> I'm like, you, you seem like an American counterpart in a lot of ways. Right? You tie one story. I'm like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> American Girls. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, that sounds a lot like me. Like I started going to How Long to Beat when I was like going into like diving back into single player games and stuff. And like, it, there's just like a period of time to like, I don't know. I, like, I agree with you. I think How Long to Beat helps a lot in that sort of single player quest, especially when I was like, all right, there's a bunch of games that I really want to play. And I'm just like, how long do these, how, like realistically, when can I actually play these games? And then I start like making my yeah. lists and I'm like, oh, there's no way I can play all my games. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it can be some harsh reality in that regard. Like if I look at just my backlog and this is after I've dumped a bunch of stuff into a custom list called low prio, which means mm, probably never going to realistically let, get to, even that the backlog is like, you know, two years worth. And I'm talking about <laughs> full days of yeah. 24 hours. Um, so that, yeah, it's Ain't nobody got time for that. Right. It is sort of reassuring though, too, because in some ways I'm just like, oh, I can never play all the games. So whatever, let's just play some games. <laughs> you know, like, yep. Yeah. Yep. And you know what though, too? I mean, like the, uh, a really fun thing about the, the site and the, the greater community, which, you know, consists of the discord and this podcast too, mm -hmm. um, is it really adds more of a, multiplayer mm. element or a community element around these single player games because we have so mm. much discussion you know we've got the games of the month we're always shooting the breeze on the discord talking about what we're playing so it's it's a lot less lonely than if it was just you in your bedroom playing your mm. your single player games by yourself and not really interacting we have a whole cool community where we talk about them yeah, especially yeah. when you don't play like newer games, right? Like, I, I don't know, most of us aren't like, I, some of us, yeah, like we'll buy the occasional new game that comes out, but it's like, oftentimes, I don't know, you go back and like, I'm playing Yakuza 0 right now. And it's like, it's not like that's like brand new in the zeitgeist, right? It's just like being able to come on and like talk with people about these games that you're playing that maybe you're a few years removed from. Um, it's nice. Now we're just And even a further, session. you and me have been like, gushing about our Game Boy and advances that we've got mag modded and that's literally yeah. the other side of the century and uh, yeah. well yeah. I mean you've got you've got people like Mochi playing SG-1000 games mm -hmm. and uh, like really old Atari games then you've got you know a lot of other people playing modern stuff and everything in between I mean it's really the whole spectrum but there's a lot of people doing really retro stuff if you look mm -hmm. on the, the forums there's a bunch of blogs about people doing retro and you know, even what you consider retro is uh, kind of a point for debate, right? Like, mm. is PS3 retro? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe technically it doesn't feel like it, but uh, to, to some it is, you know. Anyway. It's, I was going to go on a complete tangent on what eras are in retro, but I think we'll probably save that one for another time. <laughs> I, I actually have, like, 
a semi-formed theory on that, which I'm gonna. Well, you, I'm gonna you gotta, you gotta at least say the Cliff Notes version. Come on. Right. Okay. So if, if you look at the PS1, around about the end of the PS2's life, the start of the PS3's, everything went super cheap. Hmm. When that stuff starts to become expensive again, that's when it's retro, because that's that's when the demand spikes from people who grew up with it and now have the disposable <laughs> income and the nostalgia to want to jump back in. I, I don't think hmm. there's any sense putting. I suppose in a sense you're almost putting sort of 15 to 20 years on that just by that definition. But I don't think mm. there's any point saying two console generations worth because if you have like a really long one, like the PS3 360 year, that was like an eight, nine year console cycle, wasn't it? Mm. You, you have two of those and that just throws your calculations off. Um, I like so that, that theory. That, I do that's... wonder though, because like PS2 games have never really gotten much expensive. Like I, I feel like we hit an that's era. Just, so fucking many. But of that's them. what I mean, right? Yeah, like I wonder <laughs> if it'll work for like the 360, the PS3. You know, because like 360 games, like people will be like, "Give, I'll give you a quarter. Take my 360 games." You know, like there's I'm just so many. Like, like uh, that kind of measure doesn't really work, uh, at least here, because. Here in Chile, like anything that is not current generation that is used, you're not gonna get much for it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, maybe that's just a sort of North America, Europey thing. Yeah. Well, mm. let's this return is, uh, to this probably. later because this is good. Another time. Uh, this is what I'm saying. This is a whole podcast in and of itself. It is. Um, uh, why don't we yeah. keep going then? So, what's your console or consoles of choice? Good sir. <laughs> uh, can I can I Henry Cavill you and say PC? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think considering my my gaming career, uh, which is I'm not a programmer or epic gamer, but I'm just a guy. But uh, considering my gaming life in aggregate, I think the PC has to be my my main. If I look at my completions on the website too, that that backs that up. Um. And it's just, I mean, it's so great because it encompasses so many things, including the the hardware and customization piece, which for me as an engineer and just like a tech nerdy guy, I love it and love being able to upgrade and, and optimize that stuff. Um, and just the games you get so much. I mean, especially these days, we're getting a lot better ports. Companies like Capcom and Atlas that haven't been porting, you know, many of their top tier console games are finally coming to PC. Um Game Pass and other streaming and, and subscription services are arguably a good and bad thing, but it is bringing more games to PC. So uh, I think if you had to pick one platform only to play, that would be mine, just because you get so much. Um, plus mods, indies, you know, homemade stuff. Uh, you know, great platform. Otherwise, I you know, grew up with Nintendo, so I always have a soft spot for Nintendo. And there is, in my opinion, that that Nintendo magic that that you get with those games and those systems. Um, their magic is fading a little bit with some of the, the scummy practices that they've started doing lately. So Nintendo, I don't know what you're doing over there, but uh, get your shit together. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, that that's another one I really like. And and Sony too, I, uh, I got into the PlayStation ecosystem a little bit after, but I did start with a PS1 that I bought used from a buddy when I was in middle school and uh, have had each successive console as well as a PSP and Vita on the handheld. So I've always been kind of late to the PlayStation party, but I love the games. Uh, the, the JRPGs and just RPGs in general are always strong on the Sony systems. Um, that's mainly what I love it for. I mean, there's al always some great other exclusives too, like. PS3, PS4, and now PS5 are all about these like character, you know, third person adventure action games or action adventure games, if you will. Um, and that's kind of its niche. So there's a lot of good stuff there, some exclusives. So almost everything but Xbox, I guess, if I had to <laughs> summarize it quickly. <laughs> Not that I'm an Xbox hater. Um, it's just, you know, when you have a PC, an Xbox has a lot less value nowadays. Uh, you can kind of pick one or the other. And then you're pretty well covered. Yeah. And now much. I'm feeling like you, Alex, where I'm like, I don't really play Xbox either. I've always been late to the PlayStation party. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. so there. I'm so right, there. Paula, we got to find our moment. <laughs> later. It'll happen. <laughs> It'll come. <laughs> um, so nice, nice. So then what got you into gaming? Like, what's your earliest memory of like 
this is I want a game. <clears throat> I didn't choose gaming, Alex. Gaming chose me. <laughs> One day. <laughs> you can't hear it, but I'm rolling my eyes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, I was a little kid, so my memory is a little bit fuzzy. Um, you know, your your own mythology gets fuzzier and fuzzier as you get older and from when you were thinking about younger days. Um, what I do remember is living in the first house uh, I lived in with my parents, and my dad came home one day with a NES in the box. I don't know if it was new or used or what, because, again, I was like five years old, but um, maybe younger, actually, because the NES came out in 85 in the U.S., I believe. I was born in 86, but this must have been closer to like 89, maybe 90 or so. Um, so I was a little kid, four, four or five-ish years old. And, you know, we had the Mario Duck Hunt classic cartridge and light gun that it came with. And that was uh, what I remember is starting to play that. And there were uh, there was a little video rental shop in our town called um, Magic Video. And my buddy actually was, uh, his parents owned Magic Video, which I didn't get any special hookups for, but I just thought that was cool. He always had like all the new games uh, and he was a big, JRPG guy and kind of turned me on to RPGs in general. Um, but I would always go there and rent, you know, whatever cool stuff they had purely just off the back of the box. Cause that's hmm. that. And like Nintendo power was all I, uh, and like gaming magazines at the grocery store was all I knew about, you know, the latest game stuff. Um, so I kind of got into playing that way, at least in terms of home consoles. And then my other like really prominent old gaming memory is uh, there is a, or was, I don't know if it's still there, a pizza restaurant in our town called Mr. Gaddy's and uh, really good pizza. And they had an arcade part in the, you know, in the shop. And I remember they had a bunch of stuff, but uh, they had Street Fighter II Champion Edition. And I would just go there. Oh, they also had the original uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade game, which I was a huge Ninja Turtles kid growing up in the late 80s. Um, so I played the crap out of that. But yeah, Street Fighter 2, I just loved it. And, you know, that was Champion Edition, so you could play as any of the four bosses, too. And I remember beating so many kids much older than me with just the simple, like, down sweep attack because they didn't know how to block down and back to, to block those low attacks. And uh, nice. I, could, I could just, like, cheese so many people with that. And then if they, you know, were good enough to actually play normally, I could... Uh, normally beat most people either with Vega or Bison or Ryu. And uh, I just remember like a couple of times a crowd forming of like older kids because I was here as like six or seven year old kid um, with my bowl cut, you know, whooping some ass in Street Fighter. And uh, so you're that's like, that's my epic game moment. I was going to say, you're straight out of Stranger <laughs> Things. Like that's so just <laughs> or, or something, you know, like, like that scene is you. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, nice. So last off, let's talk about your username. Where does it come from? Ah. See what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so it's been shortened, shortened to Dune by, uh, people on how long to beat and like on the discord and stuff. But the, uh, my full name is <laughs> let's talk about Dune. No capitalization, just all lowercase. And that's kind of a joke, uh, of a previous name I had, which, well, let me back up a second. So. You know, doing the sci-fi series by Frank Herbert, um, been adapted into a movie and TV series, and and now a new movie coming out soon, uh, which we has promise, I think. Yeah. Um, but I got big into that and in, to the book series in college. A coworker recommended them to me, and uh, f after I read them, read most of the series, there's a character named Leto Atreides, the younger one, Leto Two. Um, he's like really the badass that does a lot of, you know, he's kind of the main protagonist of the whole series. And um, so I used some form of his name as a online handle and like playing multiplayer games and stuff for many years. And whenever there was another Dune nerd in the server, you know, playing Dota or Counter-Strike or whatever, uh, and I was playing with my friends, oftentimes they'd like want to start talking about Dune, be like, oh, Leto too, cool, you know, isn't Leto so badass or whatever, or wow, you're get out of here playing you know with your dune name like who cares about dune that's stupid either way like people would start talking about dune and my friends would get annoyed or like think it was funny and just be like oh, oh let's talk about dune yeah, we're always talking about dune and uh that's 
that's it. Then I just embraced it and became Let's Talk About Dune. That's great. <laughs> what have you beaten recently? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Smooth segue with nothing to trim out between it. <laughs> okay. Um, well, unlike you guys, I don't do this every week. So I think I'm going to cheat and like go a little bit further back to like the last month or so, if that's okay. Because totally. you always have so many impressive, like long lists of games. I'm like, damn, how do you guys beat so many games? But I've got some long ones in here. So here we go. Uh, Persona 4 Golden just beat, it's been a couple of weeks by now but uh that was a big one both of the ori games so they they came out for switch last year and uh the physicals just came out around december so both ori and the blind forest definitive edition and ori and the will of the wisps i just beat those kind of end of december early january um kingdom hearts the original but like the hd final mix version that comes on the the story so far collection for ps4 and then everyone's favorite game that I totally didn't give a 9 out of 10, 13 Sentinels, I guess, Rim. Or Ig- they pronounce it Aegis in the game, don't they? Is that kind I of forget. One of those? Truth I, be told, yeah. I forget. Is it, is it Aegis? Is it Aegis? Is it, it might be Aegis? Aegis. I think it might be Aegis. Aegis? That word. A-E-G-I-S. There's a, There's a The shield. <laughs> the shield rim. Yes, I played that, and I loved it and gave it a 9 out of 10, because even if I love it, it doesn't mean it's a 10 out of 10. Rick? This <laughs> one is, though. This is. <laughs> uh, all right. But that's uh, that's what I've beaten recently. Nice. The Ori games I want to know. Oh, sorry, go on. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I've only played the first The Ori games, but I'm looking forward to jumping into the second one. It looks like it's just better than the first. Like, It's just like a classic sequel. It takes mm. everything that was great of the first, gives you more of it. Um, there's more RPG-type elements to it with actual side quests with NPCs and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I liked that. There's a little bit of base building. Um, there's more combat. The story, I think, is a little bit like more of a punch, even though it's it's pretty minimal. Um, and there's fewer of the slightly not so great stuff. But yeah, I, I love both of them. I think they're both must plays if you like Metroidvanias or platformers. Nice. Yeah. Uh, is there less of the, cause I remember in the first one, there are some of those segments where you have to like escape things and it just becomes this like, yeah. is there less of that? Cause like, I just found that it was like, it, it didn't actually grab on to like what was good about those games. And you were just like, all right, yeah. just gonna memorize all the button presses. <laughs> Especially that the like last one was, was brutal in, in blind forest. I, I probably tried that one literally a hundred times yeah. before I finally got it. My wife was watching, like watching me, just giving me like, I'm, I'm disappointed. Look, <laughs> <laughs> I remember playing oh, that come game. Come on, like, I'm gamer cred. <laughs> I remember playing or or in the blind forest and finishing like uh, at my parents' home and I don't remember who was watching, but it was like, what what is this game? What what are you doing? Why are you skipping th- that? It's tough. And it, it, and it takes it was, trial and error too, which is you know, frustrating game design, not not always the best game design. Um Will of the Wisps. They are still there. I think there's still three, at least numerically. There's three sequences, while in the first game there were three, two. But they're toned way down. They're shorter. Um, they're better spaced. So I don't think they're nearly as intrusive as they were in the first. It's definitely not as like, it's not a back of the box like negative thing to put on your list. It's nice. an improvement over the first one. Yeah. Bump that up. Thing, I mean, I. Now that I'm hearing it, I'm probably like in the minority because I actually enjoy those segments because of oh like the sense of urgency. For some reason that yeah. that just like laser focused me into the game. It's um, true. I mean oh sorry, keep going. Oh that I was gonna it's use okay. an example of, of it done well is is Super Metroid, gonna hype Super Metroid again. It gives you two of those, one at the beginning and one at the very end. And each of them are pretty short, you know, about a minute and a half or so, two minutes to escape something that's about to explode. And uh, the thing is, though, they're more forgiving because you don't have to jump to this particular spot to get to this other spot or else you get eaten by the big bird or whatever. Um, You can fall a couple of times and still make it. Um, But they do, just like Paula said, they really get you laser focused, you know, sweaty palms. And then you just breathe a sigh of relief when you're done, you know, just because that intensity. Um, Mm. But yeah, it was better in the second one. I can definitely recommend it. A little bit stronger than the first. Rick, you were going to mention something. Yeah. If I was, it's totally... Oh, you lost it. 
nice. I was, I was <laughs> going to ask you about Kingdom Hearts because I think based on what you said about it, I'm probably not going to try again. It's a game I've tried to get into like three or four different times and bounced off very early every single time. So I sort of want to know a little bit more about whether it's worth pushing through. I feel like you said no one asked you this when you beat it, but for the, for the benefit of the audience at home. Yeah. Um, so let me preface this by just saying I'm, I'm kind of weird sometimes in that I, um, I really like to play, with some exceptions, the whole series of a game. Like I'm, I'm not just going to jump and play Kingdom Hearts 3 after not playing any of the other 27 games in the series. Don't fact check me on that number. Um, I think it's like 17 <laughs> or something. Um, um, actually, no, I've gone. <laughs> um, but for some reason, I just really wanted to play this whole series, and they have those compilations that make it really easy on PS4. So I started at the beginning, and I played it. Um, does it hold up? Do I recommend it in 2021? No. <laughs> and the beginning, like the whole first half, I think is by far the weakest. Uh, it starts you off like on Sora's little island, and you have to basically just like do some scavenger hunting around the island and some really awful uh, third-person platforming. And it's just not a good intro. I was like... I want to hit a button and like hit stuff with the big key thing. You know, I don't want to like go find a mushroom in a cave that I can't even see. But towards the end, when you kind of got a more sense of like the visual language of the game and you understand better what's going on, uh, it's a lot more fun. But to, to fight through the first half, where it's just like back and forth, item hunting and trying to figure out who you need to talk to to progress, it's just not. I don't think it's that great of a game anymore. It's. Uh, I think. I think the furthest I got was either the end or, of Traverse Town, or like the start of the Alice in Wonderland level. But the, the mm. problem is, I've also played a couple of the other ones, and because they sort of reuse levels quite a few times, like the Alice in Wonderland in three fifty eight days over two, I think might also what a stupid name for a game might be <laughs> blending in to like the, the Alice in Wonderland <laughs> of the original. I but can speak to those, but yeah, it's. I don't know. I think I'm probably going to eventually keep playing the whole series through, or at least what's on the, the story so far collection, mm -hmm. just because, I don't know, I like seeing that progression of, of a series, especially one that's such in the overall zeitgeist, you know, for so many people and gamers as Kingdom Hearts. Like, um, we've talked about it a lot, Rick, but I've been playing through some version of every East game. Yeah. And uh, I'm up to eight is my next one. And just seeing that series evolve in a short time, uh, short time for me because I played them all mostly back to back, uh, but that's really cool. I just really like seeing things evolve like that over a span of twenty years. Which, feeling old, the first Kingdom Hearts game came out in two thousand and two, which is almost twenty years ago, which just sounds kind of crazy. But yeah, I dropped yeah, pretty I mean, hard off those games. But weirdly enough, the Kingdom Hearts three D Dream Drop Distance, like the three DS one, really good because like it's quite a bit shorter and like just enjoyable as like a handheld game. That was one of the few Kingdom Hearts that I actually played through to completion. The handheld one seems to be okay. Oh. Sorry, go on. I was going to say, I would think the Kingdom Hearts concept, at least as it was in the first game where you're hopping between the different Disney worlds, would work really well as a handheld because you can like pop in, play a few levels, see a cool character you recognize from Disney, maybe learn a new ability or something, and then fight the boss and then be, be done. But like... Yeah, the, the first game took me about 25, 26 hours. And I used to guide a little bit just because I was getting frustrated and wanted to progress faster. But I mean, that's a good chunk of time. And when, when a lot of it is just wandering around, trying to figure out where you have to go next with no map or no guidance, that's not the fun part. <laughs> Especially when you consider that that's like three quarters of a 13 Sentinels playthrough. Right, but every moment of that is just pure gaming bliss, right, Rick? Exactly. <laughs> and you should be doing that instead of playing Sora's Happy Key Fun Time. Sorry, Paolo, I feel like you're going to say something then. Oh, no, don't worry. No? Oh. It's not my evening this evening. It's, <laughs> it's all, it's all <laughs> going to pot. Should um, we, uh... oh, while we're on the downward spiral, we should definitely move on to what you've retired, June, because we, uh, to give everyone a little bit of inside baseball, <sighs> we, we had a bit of a, a chat over Discord before this recording. And um, June's two most recent retirements, both for me, one for Alex, are games that we actually really like. So Sparks may well fly. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you the floor. Don't mind me as if I just eat popcorn because I will have no idea of what games are these. So. 
Okay, well, these are uh, both on handheld systems, which I know handhelds have a soft spot. Or, uh, mm. I know we're all fans of handhelds here. Let me yeah. say that. That that was words that made sense in a in a, in a row. Um, <laughs> so the first one was the third birthday, which is kind of the redheaded stepchild of the Paras- Parasite Eve series. It's technically part of the series, but very different from Parasite Eve and Parasite Eve 2, which were survival horror RPGs on PlayStation. Third Birthday is a third-person shooter with a, to be fair, cool mechanic where you take over people's bodies and you kind of possess them, you know, use them to shoot some stuff, and then when they take too many bullets you possess somebody else and you keep going and uh but your your aya the the main protagonist of Res- of Resident Evil, <laughs> of uh parasite eve while you're doing that um and it looks pretty i mean i was coming from playing the first two games which are ps1 games and the psp you know has a little bit more oomph and it has some really pretty cut scenes where i is doing all kind of badass stuff uh it just didn't really grab me it felt kind of copy paste between areas and the the gameplay got, it was interesting. I like the concept of the body swapping, but it didn't hold my interest too deeply. I never got to that point in the game where you get sucked in. I don't know if you guys feel that, but like when you're kind of interviewing a game for the first hour, maybe two, maybe 10, if it's a really long JRPG, hmm. there's kind of that, I don't know, phase. You know, you're still kind of learning the ins and outs of the game and not sure if you like it enough to keep going yet. And I never made it past that point with the third birthday. And that that maybe speaks to just where we were when we came to it, because this, you know, you started a couple of months ago, presumably, because you, you said the most recent one. How how long ago roughly was this? It was last year. So okay. I don't retire that many games. Um, There's your point in common with Paola. There <laughs> you go. That's the one. Hey, high five. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas, and I think. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think I mentioned this to you when we talked about it. The the third birthday was my first PSP game. So I got it in, I want to say 2012 with my PSP, which I got stupid cheap because the, the game shops in the UK were going into administration and they were just selling all the things. Um, and, and that was almost 10 years ago. So you were a little bit of a wee lad, weren't you? I, I was still in, in like um, <laughs> compulsory education. Yeah. Oh, so, wee little lad. Um, <laughs> 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 I was still sweeping chimneys right. on the weekend. Um, <laughs> so coming off of the DS, which was like my main um, gaming platform prior to getting the PSP, and having like proper 3D with a proper analog stick that did like proper 360 motion, that probably contributed to me being so much more receptive to it. Oh yeah, I'm sure. But I think what also helped is that the mechanic grabbed me. Um, the gameplay more generally grabbed me. And it's also actually quite a short playthrough. Mm. Because if you don't care about the story, and I didn't, because I'd never played any of the other Parasite Eve games, and this is going to anger you in return, I actually since went and tried to play Parasite Eve 1. I think I got about four hours in and retired it. Just didn't work for me one bit. I think I retired it anyway. If I didn't finish it, I got close. I'll have to check um, later on. Um but yeah, so I, I had no attachment to the story. You can blast through that that game in sort of six or seven hours for a playthrough. Um, and then on subsequent runs, because I played it through a few more times after that, you can get that down to a sub five hour play time without really trying to min max it at all. And you know, I'm kind of surprised I didn't stick with it just for the short completion because, you know, there's a game called How Long to Beat the Meta Game, which is different <laughs> than the one you play on, the, on this podcast, which is like, stacking your completions and you know getting cool tags on discord and that kind of stuff so i think there is some motivation to just completing games more than i used to have before um because of that so shorter games are a little bit appealing not only because they're convenient but also because the completion goes up <laughs> um but yeah i just i just couldn't stick with it with that but you know i thought parasite eve had a really cool gameplay you know it's like an action rpg when you get into combat and it's it's kind of real time you have to run around and not get hit by the dinosaur or whatever you're fighting and then you can cast a spell i don't know it was it was very different i had just played um final fantasy 7 again which was you know, from the year before chronologically and some other turn-based rpgs so to me it just felt really fresh i'm looking forward Ooh. to that one i need to fact check myself just really quickly 
So it, it is a longer completion than that normally. I think I got it down to sub five hour runs, but my personal notes on, on the page, and I've been playing the meta game wrong, and you'll see why in a second. It says, currently on playthrough number 11. Ooh. Ooh. You're like Tiamat's dad with the uh, 25. <laughs> <Legend of Zelda. laughs> yeah. To the point that some of those runs have completely vacated my memory. Clearly. Um, <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's So impressive. yeah, I, I pumped... I'd pumped 78 hours into that game over 11 playthroughs. So, if, if, you know, if you factor out that first 13 hour playthrough when I was working out what I was doing, that's about 65 hours over over 10 playthroughs, roughly. Yeah. So it's about a six hour completion on average once you know what you're doing. Yeah, 13 hours is a little bit too much. I mean, that's that's a third of an Igus Rim playthrough. So you, know, you can really evaluate your priorities. But what you have to remember is Igus Rim wasn't out when this came out. So. <laughs> True. Fair. Um, so what was the <laughs> other one that breaks my poor little heart, but I also understand? <laughs> and mine. Uh, well, Alex, the answer to that question, which you already know. <laughs> yes. Is, Insider trading. <laughs> a much loved Astro Boy Omega Factor, mm. which I just played a few months ago, emulated um, with keyboard control, which is actually really nice and precise. Oh. And... To be fair, I really like the game. I like the aesthetic. I like the characters, which I realized that Astro Boy is a whole big franchise, and this was my only entry point to that. So I didn't, I didn't know any of that, but I, it seemed cool. It reminded me a lot aesthetically of like Mega Man mm. um, in that game, which is totally my jam. Um, the part that frustrated me was I got through what I thought was the whole game and beat the last, what I thought was the last boss. And then it basically, I forget what it did, but it said something like, okay, Astro Boy, you've now saved the day, but I don't know if there was an alternate timeline or something, multiverse kind of thing going on, but it wanted me to go back and beat the whole thing again. And that was after six or seven hours or so, and I just didn't feel like doing that again. Yeah. So I, I marked it as retired. But I, I, new information has since come to light. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we both said to me, Alex, that technically it's probably a completion, really, if you've cleared all the stages. Oh, if you've beaten it, that the main plus one. first part, yeah, it's. I would say that's completed. It's like main plus is doing it more. I will say it's totally understandable. And like, I, I think it's a fault of that game that it's not clearer um, at the end of it that you're actually going to experience substantially new material and like new. Um, gameplay when you go and play yeah. through it again like it I, I know it sort of seems a little bit like the ghost and goblins like play through it again but in reality it's like no 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 you actually have to go on very specific missions to to different areas and you collect things that like sends you on this like time travel journey that actually unlocks entirely new stages um which again that's really like that's just the game's fault honestly <laughs> like um but yeah. I, if you play with a walkthrough mean through yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say a walkthrough for that second part is like pretty much essential. And when you do that, it's extremely fun because there's a lot of little things you have to do to get through it. But yeah, I get it. <laughs> okay. Well, knowing that, I I would not personally consider it a completion by my standards because if there's substantial content that I haven't cleared, um, to me, that's not that's not complete. But because what I was thinking, the way you described it um, on Discord before was like, you know, some shoot 'em ups you can play through, and then you have to play, or you can choose to play another loop, mm -hmm. and that loop is usually harder, and you may unlock a true ending if you beat it again. But it's literally the same game, same five or six stages. Maybe the enemies mm -hmm. have different patterns or take more damage, but not really fundamentally that different. It's just like hard mode. So I thought it was like that, but it sounds like it's actually more substantial than that. Yeah, there are new cutscenes and everything. More... Sorry, go on. Oh, sorry, like, because I, I played this quite recently, like, I played this last year, and, like, there are complete new cutscenes, and, like, you encounter new things within stages that, or, like, you're about to do this boss that you remember, and it's, like, swoop, some other dude comes in, you're, like, what? And it's, like, and, like, adds context to some of the things that you had been doing before, um, which is kind of neat, because I never knew Astro Boy either. I, I've never actually watched any of Astro Boy, and so this whole story for me was, like, oh, interesting. Um yeah. What were you going to say? It's a pretty nutty story, too. There's a lot of characters jumping in and out, some crazy stuff happening. I mean, I was kind of drawn in by the wackiness of it all, um, too. So th I definitely had some stuff going for it. I can see why it's a really well-regarded game. And if I remember correctly, a pretty well-liked developer, who I can't remember who it was right now. Treasure. Made it, right? Treasure. Treasure, yeah. So yeah. you'll know them from Gunstar Heroes, um, various shoot-em-ups. There's yeah. one I need to play of theirs on the N64, some random game where you like run around throwing things. This is just me brain building. Oh, Mystic Makers. 
that would be the one. Yes. It's a really yeah. cool platformer with like a pre-rendered uh it's 2D, but it's got like sort of pre-rendered 3D aesthetic, almost like Donkey Kong Country, but a little bit fancier. Yeah, that's that's the one. Um and I think just on on the point of whether you mark it as a completion or not, I would probably say it's more of a an analogy with near automata in the sense that most people regard that a route as a main completion because it sort of tells a self-contained story albeit there are new challenges new things to encounter if you follow it through i think where they are a little bit better is they're a bit more explicit about what's happening when you start again um but but other than that i'd say they're, they're pretty close in terms of what they are and and how you would count them in terms of main, main plus 100%. But it, as always, it, it's very much a personal preference thing in, in some respects. For sure. And, and I haven't played Nier Automata yet, although it's on my wish list. But, uh, you know, gaming expectations, I think, have probably trended towards things becoming much more explicit. You know, developers have told you very clearly, in most cases, I think on average, they've told you more clearly what to expect, what you need to do now. You've just unlocked something. Woohoo! You see a pretty animation. It's like, there'll even be a pop up on screen that says, play it again on hard mode for blah, blah, blah rewards. You know, it's like this whole achievement unlocked, instant gratification, you know, sense of pride and accomplishment type thing. Um, but expectations now are a lot different than they were in the early 2000s when Astro Boy and other GBA games came out. So I can forgive them, you know, at the time. And maybe we'll get into this discussion on one of our later questions, but I can forgive them for those choices. Yeah. Um, when, when look from the perspective of somebody back then. Yeah. It's um, with all the other stuff we've got yet to come to in mind, shall we press on to the stuff that we're currently playing right now? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Do you want to kick us off? Rala? Nice. Uh, okay. So I've been playing a bunch of stuff. Uh, I think I'm going to leave a uh, back Backstage pass and Absu for next week because other category. And uh, I've been playing Beer Fear and Adventure episode 1926, <laughs> that is the sequel of Beer Fear Faded Memories. So it's not a fan disc, it's a full blown follow up. It's a full blown sequel okay. because uh, in Beer Fear Faded Memories uh, for the Nintendo Switch. Um, after you get like the final final ending, like the finale where everything like kind of wraps up, you realize there's a lot of stuff that the other roads didn't quite cover. Or maybe like you ended like in a happy ending, but for now kind of deal. Uh, I see. So I think the Switch version, I don't know if it was in the Vita version because I didn't even know the Vita version existed until recently, but it seems like in the Switch version they added the prologues to to the sequel of the of episode 1926. To bait you in. A bit to bait you in, but the sneaky if, motherfuckers. If anyone like kinda gets their hands into the sequel like in Japanese, uh, I highly advise you go through those uh little prologues again because i did at least for the dante route that is a the one i'm i'm going through right now and it's like oh i cannot like i remember where where i was and what is happening now and it helps you like get up to get a refresher what happened in the last game and where are things going now hmm. um they need to do I'm the like, thing previously on pure theory like <laughs> you need to have little <laughs> movie recaps please i actually like in color cross Mali's, they had like a little movie that said like this happened now we're doing this uh, i'm kind of up all that if you're ready to have that a lot of the telltale games do that between chapters i like it, mm -hmm. it makes it very cinematic <laughs> yeah i was just saying like the yakuza is here right now it's like every time you switch protagonists they're just like uh, last time in the tale of Kiryu or something and it's so nice like I'm just like oh thank you yeah I kind of forgot some of those plot points I'm an old man now I need you to remind me <laughs> <laughs> like any game that has like an ongoing story between um, either chapters or releases needs to have that really uh, besides Piper I'm playing I've been 
I'm still playing Genshin Impact, going through like these uh, lantern event that's going on, and I'm not doing that many missions. Like there are like twenty something missions or more that had to do like with the event. I was like, they are short, but most of them are like fetch quests. So no fun and good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my like my overall interest in Genshin Impact is just like. It's slightly and slowly dying out because of how grindy that game is. And I know I am I am like an RPG fan and I play like Team Mega Tensei and stuff. But Team Mega Tensei isn't like nearly as grand, grindy as Genshin Impact gets. And that's saying a lot. Plus it probably helps that you have a defined sort of start and end point, which you just straight up don't with a game like Genshin. Yeah, especially since Genshin doesn't even have an end. Like, it is an ongoing game, and it's going to be ongoing for, like, the next two years. Yeah. And end of tour, I'm seeing the end of it. I can totally relate. I've I've had no compulsion to go back since, I think it was three or four weeks ago I mentioned I'd last played any of it, and I just don't ever want to. I don't, you know, you know it's not like you actively dislike a game, but you think about the idea of playing, it's like, eh. Yes, I no. Literally, things that things that are not infinite are more beautiful, right? I mean, mm-hmm. when things have a start, beginning, or start, middle, and end, um, you have to appreciate them more. Like, like a novel or a game that actually ends, or like human life. Hey, eh? there you go. Yeah, bringing existentialism <laughs> right into to- it. <laughs> <laughs> um, My- Another point uh, playing out that actually kind of has a name is Jurassic World Evolution. That is pretty much okay. So, you know, the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World movies. Now it's time for the player to make their own park. And uh, there's Five Island, and the first Four Island, I think. Yeah, you have like. Uh, missions and you are given the park like in a certain state like the first park is like your tutorial area so there isn't like anything crazy going on except the random triceratops getting out of uh, the pen and start breaking havoc on your little park but anyways so it's like um, this a building sim game, right? It's not an action game or scary game. It's very much your build your dinosaur park simulator. Jurassic oh, World cool. Tycoon. Yeah, uh, cool. Pretty much. And I'm actually enjoying it a lot more than I thought it, I would, especially because the opening half an hour or so is like, I don't know what I'm doing. They're telling me I need to go fetch fossils, and then I have to do things, but I'm not sure of what I'm doing. And like... After an hour or so, he's like, okay, I think I'm... Like, you get into the rhythm of things. So... I still I was don't... Ask... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I still don't can, uh, like... can you do trolley stuff like you could do in Roller Coaster Tycoon? Like, um, like the Jurassic Park analogy would be you know, having a T-Rex exhibit with no fences and it just runs rampage and eats all the people or like something like that. If you just want to goof off, um, you kind of need the fences like to build like certain buildings to have the dinosaurs, but the the T Rex can probably just escape if it is not happy, and by not happy it means like it is not like comfortable in its little, um, like its little uh, pen thingy where you put it. Mm-hmm. That and that happened with my triceratops because um, each dinosaur has like stats. So and there's like um, they have this comfort zone kind of thing. So there are like more social dinosaurs that like raptors that you have to put like in big groups because they they live in big groups. They they do stuff like that. Triceratops like don't like other triceratops. Okay. So I had three up and along 
other herbivores. And they just got mad and started attacking people. <laughs> it's like, uh, I am not going to live with the, the, those two here. Um, fuck this shit, I'm out. And they just <laughs> run on your park and, and cause chaos. I, it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Some aggressive uh, herbivores there. Yeah, you also have to um, have some precautions when you are like uh, having like these carnivore spans because uh, you have like these um, rangers. Yeah, they rent your building where the rangers are the ones who repair stuff on your park. And they are also the ones who replenish like the little feathers on your dinosaur cages and stuff. And the dinosaurs can attack them. So, um, so if you have like a carnivore tent, you, uh, like a carnivore cage, you either have to find a way to, to, to have like feathers spread out in a way that um, you can like see that there's no raptors like nearby this feeder and then you go replenish it and run away or use your ACU helicopter um put the dinosaurs to sleep momentarily and then replenish the the feeders so it's actually a little bit more complex than it was gonna be <laughs> like but I thought it was gonna be. It's been fun. It's been fun. Uh, the second island isn't as fun because um, storms and they can cause a power outage. You don't want to have carnivores in that island. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't get controlled by the electrical fences that are offline, right? Yeah. If they like remember that from the first Jurassic Park movie. That was yep. a plot point. <laughs> yep. <laughs> It's like, uh, I don't know, it's like, there's this narrator that is actually the narrator from the Jurassic Park movies. So hmm. each time you like do a thing in the park or get a new dinosaur and stuff, he just comments on that. And it is, it is pretty great because he was like, oh, look, I see a Triceratops. You you think that it's pretty cute now, but just wait for it. Um, or I think that I don't remember if it was like a comment on either raptors or genetic modification because you can do that. But he was like, hmm, you haven't learned anything from the movie. <laughs> That's yeah. the whole point of the Jurassic Park franchise is that no lessons are ever learned. It's just the same cycle of mistakes over and over in a different place or on a different scale, but it's always and no we lessons. Are, and we're always there at the movie theater to see the train wreck. Yeah. What's this other one that you're playing? Uh, oh, it's Mafia. So um, I actually wanted to like go back into my comfort zone for a little bit to play like a visual novel that is not in Japanese. Mm. Uh, um, and this one in particular, uh, I'm like one hour in, but it's been pretty interesting so far. So you play as this protagonist who is an, she has amnesia and appear like in this weird place and she has no idea what is going on. And she is in, I'm going to make a lot of mistakes here because I'm still like grasping like the, the knowledge of this place. But it is like in this town of Oz. And um, there's like these mafia families that are, and the characters are based like in a uh, storybook characters uh which i found kind of neat and the character is referred to as fuka uh, because uh, the the us family kind of named her to call her something in the meantime and she's pretty much like trying to recover her memories and she eventually has to choose a mafia family to belong to because 
for some reason, you have to belo belong to a mafia family here. And there's a lot that I, there's a lot of stuff that is going on that it, I'm like, I don't even know what all these things are. <laughs> and so it's a character. And that's pretty much all I can say about it. Like the, the, the music so far, the art style and all the presentation stuff has been like pretty cool. Nice. Uh, so I'm just gonna wait and see where the story is taking me. Stay um, tuned for more in future weeks, then I guess. <laughs> uh, pretty much. Hopefully, I don't like um, marathon it again because with backstage pass, <laughs> I didn't sleep the other day and it was horrible. <laughs> Uh, Rick, do you want to regale us with what you're playing? I certainly can. I certainly can. So um, I'm still playing Cyberpunk. I am very close to the end. I literally am sweeping up the last few side quests. So I've cleared all like the main gigs and side quests in all bar one region of the map. So there's an area, um, I think it's literally just called City Center because it, it's like the central hub of Night City where I've still got a few bits to pop in and do. Um, and I'm in the middle of like uh, a fairly meaty Johnny Silverhand related side quest. Once I've done all of those, the, the, the end game of the story is there waiting for me to do. Nice. I will be surprised if I'm not ready to gush about that in my completions next week. Um, still playing Hades, not really got anything new to say about it. It's Hades. It's good. Mm -hmm. I like it. I haven't burnt out on it the way you did Alex just yet. But are you playing it with a pomegranate? Right. No, I'm not, and uh, I accept that 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 is a real weakness in my game. Um, for anyone who isn't aware, someone recently on Twitch did a run of Hades with a pomegranate, and it was the smartest dumb thing I've seen in a long time. Uh, he like wired a bunch of switches into the the flesh of the fruit of the pomegranate. He cut it into like eight or ten pieces and had switches in each of them. So yeah, he was literally just tapping on chunks of pomegranate cut up. To control the game. It's yeah, and it was like makey makey, so he was earthed and he Great. could beat the circuit. It's yeah. so silly. <laughs> um and then I've been playing a few really small games and a few multiplayer games. Um so since I finished Mirror's Edge on iOS, which I'll talk more about next week, um I started playing the House of the Dead Overkill, the Lost Reels, which is like a few side off scenarios spin-off scenarios, rather, from the House of the Dead Overkill, which came out for Wii um, back in 08, 09 sort of time. Um, and it's fine. It's slightly weird in that you have to move the reticle and then press a button to fire rather than just sort of tapping what you want to shoot on, which you'd expect on iOS. Uh, but it works. It looks good for a game of the time. Reviews seem to suggest that I might have some problems with accessing the last couple of levels, which I believe are behind a storefront that I can no longer access, which is one of the great perks of that era of gaming now. Um, but we'll, we'll see. I'll, I'll, if nothing else, probably enjoy the content that is there. Um, I've been playing a little bit of a game called Night in Plus on the Vita, which is kind of like Zelda, like original NES Zelda, without any of the overworld stuff. Um, and just it, dungeons or what? Yeah, just dungeons. And it's fine. Um, the combat's okay. Although there's a little bit more of a delay before your sword swing than I'd like. <laughs> there's a, a clever little bit of puzzling. The map could stand to be better, but like it's fine. Um, at the moment, it, <laughs> it, it's one of the games. Sounds... Of... All right. <laughs> like, listen, I, I only deal in ringing endorsements. <laughs> <laughs> but I've, I've just been picking up and putting it down for five minutes and it's still very early doors so it could go either way um, and in my quest to beat all of the main Metal Slug games um, I'm currently playing the first of the two Neo Geo Pocket spin-offs uh, Metal Slug First Mission which plays more or less like the main entries just much less graphically impressive and the screen estate is much more constrained which is fine, because if you know anything about me, you know I am a sucker for a good handheld D-make. Uh, I think way back in Season 1, the first game I talked about was the Game Boy Advance port of Stuntman, which, by the way, is incredible, and you should give a go, because it actually genuinely holds up. It's better than the PS2 version. Ignition is like better, the, the main um, console sequel, 
but the GBA version of the original stands up better than the PS2 version does. Anyway, um, I I'm imagine having- that was probably like a top down perspective, like 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 original GTA perspective, or is it no quasi 3D? Oh wow! The the devs did some magic, and there's sort of a forced perspective thing where you get a little bit of fish eyeing either side of the screen, but in motion, you don't particularly notice it. And it is not only graphically remarkable, but from a gameplay perspective, just works. Just really, really works. And it, it suits handheld play as well, because it's it's um, sort of two minute long stunt sequences that you just replay and replay and replay until you nail them. Um, I used to have it on my micro and I'd play it on the bus. I've gotten very sidetracked. Uh, Metal Slug first mission. <laughs> um, it's more Metal Slug, which is fine by me. The only wrinkle, um, I'm playing it on an emulator on a PSP. Um, there's no pause button. So they, because the Neo Geo Pocket only had an A, a B, and an option, um, and the main three functions you need for Metal Slug are shoot, jump, and your special attack, which is normally grenades. Um, option now switches um, between your normal fire and your grenades. So I keep going to throw a grenade and then do some firing and instead throwing four grenades and not firing normal shots because I've, I've masked my option in such a way that I'm expecting it just to throw a grenade. Um, That's tough, man. You really need a third button for that. You do, but, but the, the I, console didn't have it. So yeah. it is what it is. <laughs> um, and the, the one saving grace, because on if you think about it, the option would have been a pause, you couldn't pause that game, which is sort of criminal for a handheld game. And this is, again, a little bit of foreshadowing to the topic that we'll come to. But because I'm playing on an emulator, I can go into the emulator menu and not have to think about it. So it's fine. There you go. Um, but yeah, and then just briefly, multiplayer games. Um, I've been playing much more of them again recently. So my main three are Fall Guys, which is still fantastic. Um, Warzone, which is just mainly what I play with my IRL friends. Um, it, it's a great game just to to chat around and shoot the shit because I can't do that on my third game, which is Rocket League, uh, because I am horribly competitive on it. And most of most of my sessions, like outside of the in between bit in the lobby between games, is just talking rotations and I'm going for this and challenge that and all the rest of it. So it's just not conducive to conversation with friends that you might otherwise have with a multiplayer game. Um, I can vouch for that because uh, Rocket League is one of the games I like to play with my younger brother. It's pretty much that, Mario Kart or Smash. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's definitely, we're shooting the shit catching up Rocket League, which is just like really casual uh, wherever we get put in in non-competitive mode. And sometimes we win, but most of the time we don't. Mm -hmm. And then there's like, (laughs) hey, we're actually trying to play Rocket League where there is no shooting the shit. It is all rotation and we still don't win that much, but at least we do okay. But we really tried, you know? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. what rank are you out of curiosity i am like a uh, concrete tier minus three <laughs> i didn't Which know that was one it's Please. not it's you know it's like <laughs> under- um super secret one you've got to lose 20 in a row and hold yeah. lnr the whole time nice yeah actually no Dude, I, I i don't even know i don't even be ranked sorry do you want to go ahead and share what you're playing then I think yeah. yeah mine is mine is really quick because i don't really play too many games at once i usually only play uh one game at once but right now i am playing i, I know i've mentioned it a couple times but i'm playing super smash brothers ultimate and um mainly my motivation there is just to you know be able to play with friends um and i i've kind of finished what i wanted to do with it which was unlock all of the characters at least the from the vanilla release so that i had them available to play um in multiplayer I just finished that a couple of days ago and you know, part of me wants to get the fighters passes to get everybody else, but man, that's another 50 bucks. I don't think I want to spend that on, uh, I on think... like 10 more characters. What the fuck? There's a that's lot expensive. of characters now. Um, it's, I think it's going to be exactly like 12 or so total. Well, well, there's two uh, more. They just released there. They just yeah. announced the ones last week from Xenoblade mm-hmm. two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's going to be two more after that. And each but one yeah, comes I mean, it's like with like thirty stages bucks for the first pass. Trophies. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, damn, for thirty bucks for the first batch, and then I think it's another twenty bucks, maybe thirty bucks, somewhere around there for the second batch. It's like um, a five or a character. It's not as bad as I thought it was. I thought that was per pack of six was fifty bucks, which would be a bit obscene. 
that. Right. Yeah, I think 50 bucks will get you everything that's planned for DLC. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I don't know if I can stomach that yet. And it's not physical, damn it. I wish I could get a, like a Super Smash Brothers Ultimate Ultimate Edition that's like the, <laughs> when they release all the DLC, but they probably won't because yeah. Nintendo hasn't ever done that unless they release Super Smash Brothers Ultimate Deluxe for the Switch 2, but I don't know. So anyway, there's that. And um, the other one is Xenogears, a pretty classic JRPG from the PS1 made by Squaresoft. And I like it. I don't love it. It hasn't aged that well in some regards. It has some things that are interesting. For example, there's really not much of any emphasis on gear at all. When I say gear, I mean equipment that your character wears. There's a huge focus on gears, which are like mecha that you control, which is the Xeno gears piece. But um, yeah, you're mainly like a martial artist guy, and you do a lot of handheld combat, hand to hand combat. And you do a lot of combos. You can actually press different button presses in combat to execute different combos, and you have to learn them through grinding a bit. Um, so that's pretty neat. And the story actually hits on some pretty heavy themes. Uh, religion is a big focus. Um, class differences and xenophobia uh, is a big dif- is a big focus of the story. And the writing is, I'd say, better than the average '90s JRPG. Like when it wants to be serious, it really is. And uh, there's not that many like cringy bad dialogue moments, which could be the localization, of course. Um, but it's it definitely shows its age. It's in like this weird quasi 2D, 3D. So most everything is 2D sprites, but the environments are like really rough 3D, and you can rotate the camera around. Um, so you can always rotate the camera with the L and R buttons, and then it does that thing where it just shows you a new sprite at that angle once you've rotated it, kind of like old Mario Kart. Um, and it's super low resolution, so it's sometimes hard to tell, you know, where the item shop is in the town, or maybe you don't have the right angle on the screen. So, um, I don't know. When you compare that to, like, Final Fantasy VII, which has super pre-rendered everything for backgrounds, I think that might work a little better as a game. But it's probably a back-of-the-box thing, you know? Fully 3D environment. You can rotate the camera. Um, but does it hold up? I don't know. And in their defense, it was a weird time for 3D all around. It's not like they were the only ones. No. And I mean, there were a lot of 2D and 2.5D games in that era of the 32-bit, 64-bit. I think Nintendo 64 games tended to go more for like, we want to be fully 3D at the expense of frame rate, our like game (laughs) or everything (laughs) sometimes. Uh, PlayStation had more of that was either like fully 2D, like the Breath of Fire 3 and 4 games. Those are awesome fully 2D RPGs. But yeah, Xenogears, um, it's in a bit of a weird no man's land. But I'm going to finish it through. I think I'm about halfway done right now at about 25 hours. And I'm playing it on my hacked Vita, which is nice because through the PSP emulator called Adrenaline, which plays PS1 games you know, natively through the emulator, um, you can do a fast forward feature which isn't like super fast. It's more like uh, one and a half to maybe 1.75x speed. And it speeds everything up nicely, especially battles, which I mentioned all the combos. Like they have these really long combo animations that take forever to do. Um, But even just like scrolling through text and moving around town is everything's faster too. But you can just leave it on all the time for the most part. And uh, that just speeds everything up. So my in-game time will be much longer than my real life time, which as a busy guy is a plus. Nice. I'm going to l- blow through some of what I've been playing here because um, most of it I'll be talking about very soon in their next podcast. So I'm still playing Yakuza 0, getting close to the end. It's getting crazy, loving it. Um, makes me wonder, like, how does the story go on for six more <laughs> freaking games? I'm like, let's do this. Um, doing Ring Fit Adventure now, you know, at least five times a week. Um, really fun, really great. Um, I started playing Pokemon Car GB2, Great Rocket Dan Sanjo, which is basically the <laughs> a Japanese only sequel to the Pokemon trading card game for the Game Boy. Um, this is for the Game Boy Color. So I'm actually going to talk about the first one next week. Uh, I had something sort of sad happen that made me retire that one, but uh, oh no, uh, yeah, it's okay. I beat it as a kid. I've never played this one though, and so. Uh, going through it, like, just from the get-go, I was like, this is a significantly better experience. They just There's all these quality of life things that they've added to it, and you could tell that this one was designed primarily with the Game Boy Color in mind. Now, I mean, like the, other, the first one, 
was as well. Like it was a Game Boy Color cartridge, but it had the like black um, one, right? So you could play it in the Game Boy and in the Game Boy Color. But the second one was one of those clear yeah. carts, right? And so it was just Game Boy Color. And it's just obvious, like it's much... Uh, prettier there are significantly more cards in it there's just all these little things that like add up nicely and i have to say like i think people often sort of skip this out but this is a fantastic fantastic game it is significantly more strategic than pokemon is and like in general i find the battles like i lose um significantly more than i would ever lose in a pokemon game um and it doesn't feel that bad when you lose because you're like all right let's just get right back into it um so i really enjoy it and i'm also coming extremely close to the end of mario and luigi superstar saga i had dropped this game and retired it a while back and um i just decided to pick it back up again Uh, i just I, i started it and was like sort of done right it was like you know those soft retires when you're just like i'll probably come back one day Um, right it's that which we have exactly which i did and amazing i really love this game i have to say uh gets a little bit annoying in the last little bit it's kind of like a boss rush and it's sort of um it's a it's getting a little tedious right now like i'm just going through and fighting all the koopalings and i'm like jesus christ um all these battles are like the same and it's just like it sort of feels like as i get towards the end that they're just like oh it's the ending now okie dokie let's uh fight a bunch of dudes <laughs> they're like Seriously, man. You're ending Come on. You say no castle? Uh, yeah, right. And so I'm just sort of like, which is too bad because everything before it was so incredible. And I, I I'm going to talk a lot more about this next week, I think, because I think it will be completed by then. Um, but yeah, I'm going to leave it there for now. It was a super cool game, though. And I think much better as a Game Boy Advance game. I just, the graphics are so charming. I just find those like quasi 3D ones when they move to the DS, they're just, I don't like them. I just find them weird. Uh, it's like, you know, they're like, they're just, there's something charming about the 2D. Now, if you're someone who loves that, like, quasi 3D, 2D looking th- stuff, then sure, play it on the DS. But um, I I just find the, the 2D graphics on the Game Boy are crisp and beautiful. Uh, but yeah, and, and having played it that way, I actually agree. But the, the interesting thing is they made a few tweaks for the 3DS version. Um, yeah. And when I looked into it, it was a case of, that is the way to play it overall. I think the 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 analysis I looked at or read or, or whatever um, said the visuals aren't as nice, but that's subjective. Uh, the sound is objectively not as good. Mm-hmm. Everything else is better. And uh, and honestly, though, the sound and the graphics is the shit I got to look at and pl- listen to the whole time. And that's where I was I like, say, like, damn, that's, that's a lot yeah. of Yeah, <laughs> I mean... I, I don't know what to tell you. I thought they were fun in the 3DS version. I had played a bit of the GBA version um, because one of my cousins had it when I was younger, so I'd seen him play a bit of it. Um, Certainly didn't hamper my experience any, but... I know it would hamper mine. It was was enough to be the point where I would not have played it. You know what I'm saying? Like I was like, knowing the two of them, I was like, I'm not going to play that one. I will play the Game Boy. I'm not going to play that one. Uh, Now, I'll make the sacrifice for Bowser's Inside Story. Um... And that's mostly because there isn't another version that looks prettier. <laughs> so I'm like, I'll go do that. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, that's it for me. So why don't we move on then to our topic of the week brought to us by Dune. Dune, do you want to share what our topic is that we'll be discussing? Sure. Thank you, Sir Alex. <laughs> um, my question for the group, for the panel, is... Uh, I think we all play a good amount of older R, Rick, maybe, by your definition, retro games. And when we go and we play those games, we re-rate them, we evaluate them, we discuss them. Um, do we do we judge them based on our expectations now in 2021 or thereabouts? Or do we try to kind of put our mind back to the time when they were released and what the general expectations and standards were for games at that time? Please discuss. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll jump feet first in on this. And I sort of think the answer is a bit of both. So um, when you put this on the show notes ahead of this, um, someone in the Discord had just shared a video um, about Forest in uh, in video games. And the idea that or part of the, the thesis of that video was that you can never experience something devoid of context. You can't truly experience something on its own um talking about the idea of translation um you know it, it, there is no such thing as a pure translation because the act of translation involves you 
reading interpretations that just don't exist in the native text, um, adding context that the original author would never have had. Uh, and I, I think that kind of logic applies to retro games as well. I think there are certain things where you will be cognizant of the fact that that is a product of its time. Uh, to go back to what you were saying about Xenogears in terms of the the bad 3D and, and some of the things like text being a little bit slower than you'd be used to or you might like. Um, but you, you still have to live through those. You know, fast forward or no fast forward, that's still a part of the game. And for better or worse, you are coming to the game now with the context that you have and with the knowledge of other games that you've played that maybe weren't out when that game first happened. Um, it's the same as as when we all, I think, to one degree or another, dropped Super Mario uh, World. Because that... that <laughs> well, I didn't I'm, drop that, to be fair. I've beaten that. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> About it. Me and Paolo <laughs> dropped it. Um, it. It's a game that doesn't stand up to a 2020 palette. Mm -hmm. And, and I wish I could it. say I disagree with you, but I don't know if I really can objectively or if it's my own bias because I played it when I was six years old on Christmas morning in 1991. <laughs> you know, so like, yeah. that's not... I know that the internet agrees it's an objectively classic game, but I don't know, you know, again, so many of us have that experience where coming to it fresh uh, mm -hmm. could be a very different experience. I, I got to give that to you. This is actually and something. Then you to that point. Yeah, sorry, crack on it. Yeah, I was going to say, I saw this in the <laughs> the unpopular, like, um, opinions thing on, like, uh, on how long to be uh, forums where, like, someone was talking about, it's like, games don't age, um, like, people... Uh, and they're like sort of opinions age and I was like that's the most stupid semantic argument I've ever heard because I'm like games that's don't exist that's never gone back to play GoldenEye right I just go, that yeah and I was like games exist uh, to be played right and so like ultimately you're getting into the semantic argument of like at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because the person playing it is going to have a subjective experience of the game, right? And so it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, games can age poorly um, and games can be something that was incredible at the time right um and be something that everyone at the time goes like this was amazing um like i don't know for instance ign gave skyward sword a 10 out of 10 when it came out objectively if that game came out now with breath of the wild it was not gonna score that right like it's just like it has aged differently. It has the context of Breath of the Wild now. So when you go back and play it, um, you can theoretically in your mind go like, and of course this isn't always a great example. I know I'm shitting on Skyward Sword all the time, even though I picked it up for Fantasy Critic League. Uh, but <laughs> um, just saying that like, as an example, there could be some people who play it now and go like, I don't know if I like this as much because um, they had that contextual knowledge. Now they might, be able to just play it and enjoy it so much on its own merits. But I still feel like for me personally, I'm always going to be thinking about uh, how does this game, how am I enjoying it now? And I might be willing to slightly forgive some things if I know that it's a game that was developed like at an older time. Like for instance, uh, you know, I played Final Fantasy um, Adventure on the Game Boy and I'm like, this game's probably going to have weird hit detection. <laughs> it's like, oh, it did. <laughs> and I'm like, that's fine, but I, it was still enjoyable enough to me, you know. Um, on the on the flip side of it, I also sometimes respect a game a little more, knowing that it's old. If it has stuff that I'm like, that was a great idea, and it's like, oh shit, games don't even always do this now, or like even just something like in the Pokemon card game that I'm playing, they allow me to modify the text speed, and I'm like, thank you. Not enough games let me do this these days where I can just like click a button and it's like, it'll just instantly appear the text because I'm like, I read way faster than your do 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 shit, you know? I'm like, right? Don't make me hit A every time to like keep it going. Just like create an option where it auto appears. I'm like, just be cool. So I'm like, nice. Quality life. of life is a big thing. I think quality of life is a big improvement in general in the industry. Um, and part of that, I, I'm going to totally speculate, but I think it's just because games itself are now such a business and so mainstream that, um, you know, there's a lot of people involved in these and they do a lot of um, alpha and beta testing and making sure that all aspects of the game are optimized in such a way to ultimately make the most money, right? So that means be somewhat more accessible to a broader base of people. And you don't want someone to not play the game because the tech speed is not fast enough, right? You want to 
have options for it to be, um, you know, somewhat customizable or rebind your keys or whatever. Now I say that and there's still games that don't do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and they rightfully get a lot of shit for it when they don't, especially these days. And um, I think that's the point. Sorry, just to, to jump in. I mean, it, it speaks to what you were saying about your background in terms of not really having any games coverage, not really knowing. Whereas um, even a few years ago, if you think back to the Order 1886, people knew a week before that came out, it was going to be a five-hour experience of which half would be cutscenes. If, if, a, if a game's not got rebindable keys, right on the Steam discussion page, that will be in the top comments or the top threads. Uh, there, there's nowhere to hide that kind of oversight anymore and that's combined with the experience of 40 years of titles coming out and making those mistakes upon wit upon whose shoulders we now stand he says butchering that <laughs> turn of phrase <laughs> but that's Sorry. exactly the, the point yeah. you're saying right it's that like some games are actually like for instance five years ago might have been a better experience than now right like there and i don't have like exact examples to pull out but there are just games actually you know what the original pokemon games i mean there's an there's an argument to be made that 10 years ago those games were more enjoyable to experience than they are now now at this point you have so many goddamn remakes of it that like unless you got the nostalgia i'm not gonna honestly suggest those games to a new game a new person like go to your happy place Paul. go to your happy place everything's <laughs> fine but, <yeah. laughs> but you know what i mean like i wouldn't be like oh hey buddy you've never played a pokemon game why don't you play the 1998 pokemon red like i'm like they're gonna be like no. what's yeah, going on fire red or leaf green instead or maybe like mm-hmm. soul silver or something something that's a little more modern mm-hmm. and that's that's a beautiful thing about long series is there's usually some entry point that's a good entry point Right, like you don't want to tell someone to go play Final Fantasy one or two, the original Famicom or NES versions. You probably want to go play, you know, maybe seven. A lot of people started with seven, maybe ten. It's pretty. Oh, the PSP uh, version one. What was that? Sorry. The PSP, the version, the one, yeah. PSP version of the yeah. first one. Mm-hmm. I've played the PSP versions of one, two, and three, and I think they're all uh, the way to go. But um, but yeah, so let me throw out this this title for consideration into the. Is it really that good now, or or did it just was it so legendary at the time? Super Mario sixty four. So Ooh. a lot of people have come to it recently because of the three D All Stars compilation last year. Um, I can tell you, as a little kid, when it came out, mind blowing, running around in the three D space. That was my first exposure to a super fully three D polygonal uh, world, and just the freedom of running around and jumping around and the analog stick and you know different speeds of motion all the stuff that's now ubiquitous in 3D gaming, that was pretty brand new at the time. And I know some people that never even played the levels that didn't even know you could jump into the paintings just because they were dumb kids, you know? And they would just run around <laughs> yeah. the Mushroom Kingdom, Peach's Castle area, and that was enough game for them, you know? Um, but is it is it an amazing 3D platformer in 2021 vision? Please discuss. <laughs> I think so, but I think for different reasons than it was when it came out. Um, because that game is a speedrunner's heaven because of the amount of flexibility it gives you, the the open-ended nature of the challenges, the way it allows you to approach them. Um, and I, I think that's given that game a new lease of life beyond you know what you're talking about in terms of the, the paradigm shift that it represented on release. Um, and I think it probably does speak to certain very specific titles Um breaking the rule and, and being i don't want to say timeless but maybe standing the test of time is a better way of saying it well, yeah. that's my personal take okay. what, what do you think paula I feel I like when I... oh, good. oh sorry there was thinking about uh, mario 64 because i haven't played that game in a long while and i didn't even finish it because it was a uh it was my friend's uh game and i only got to play it when i went to their house but from what I remember, it was like, it was fun. It was a solid game, I guess. But by today's standards, I don't, I mean, by today's standards, it is an impressive game because it did what, like, both the Mario and the Zelda series did something that not many games at the time did, that was to make that transition between 2D and 3D in a seamless or almost seamless uh, fashion. But, I still think that when playing older games, um, it is hard not to 
to it is very hard to take off those either nostalgia goggles or modern goggles. Mm -hmm. Uh so at least when I played older games, if I play like a more modern iteration of the game or something similar to the game that I did it better, but after it, it's still difficult to appreciate the game for what it was in that time. Um, it happens to you, for example, with uh, Fire Emblem, the first Fire Emblem <laughs> game that I ended up retiring. There were so many things wrong for a modern audience that if you play the newer Fire Emblem games, going back to the first one is going to be difficult because of how the newer ones have spoiled the player pretty much with all the quality of life improvements. Uh, for the Zelda games, I think it's a little bit easier to go back, at least up until um, um, I'm trying to think like the the two these Zelda games are mm -hmm. I think are pretty solid. And you can like go back to them, unless it is like Zelda one or Zelda two that you have to be like in a specific mindset to enjoy them. In my opinion, um, the three D games I find it easier to go back to my Euras Mask mm -hmm. over Ocarina of Time because mm -hmm. of even in, if they came out like one year apart, how much a Euras Mask like took what Ocarina of Time did well and just ran with it and added so much more and felt like such a different experience. I feel like that that game is standing more like the test of time that Ocarina of Time does. I've heard that a lot, actually. And confession time, I still haven't played Majora's Mask. Actually, I haven't played many of the 3D Zeldas, except Breath of the Wild. But uh, I've, I've heard that a lot. I really am excited to play it, probably the 3DS version, soon, trademark. But uh, <laughs> definitely will. Yeah. Hot take. The 2D Zeldas are the best Zeldas. And I'll stay by that. <laughs> I'm like Link to the Past, yeah. all the like Oracle, Game Boy Links, like Awakening, um, Link Between Worlds, like all those games. I just think they like, I don't know, as like a, a soul experience, I find they just, they're just so good. They're just tiny. Yeah, like the um, Link's Awakening, I actually got pretty far into that game before the remake got announced. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that I found like... What's the word? Like annoying for that game was only having like two item buttons mm. because it was a Game Boy game. And and for that reason, like the 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 Switch remake, like it just doing that quality of life improvement, like being able to have more items equipped, that made that game like from a probably like an eight to a near a ten for me. Same. There's definitely something to be said about the modern, pretty much standard controller, right? With the dual sticks and the D-pad and the two triggers and all that. I mean, imagine playing GoldenEye with that instead of having to use the stupid C buttons, which is like a huge thing with all the, all the Nintendo 64 FPSs, right? Like Turok and GoldenEye, you just had left thumb stick plus C buttons for your aim. Um, or like Mario 64, left stick for movement and then C buttons for camera. Um, so are many games playing, would be better. Or just playing any N64 game without an <laughs> N64 controller. Like, I mean, yeah. I don't feel like yeah. too uncomfortable to, to play with, but... For real, though. There, it's a weird one. Like, after a, weird a few one. hours, yeah. it, it, it's like, no, no, I don't want to see this thing. Nintendo's all about, <laughs> like... Oh, the, the dream to play N64 now is like, through an emulator, upscaled at like 20 times internal resolution. You can get texture packs now for a bunch of games, like mm -hmm. most of the main Nintendo games, like the Zeldas and Banjo-Kazooie and some others. Um, with your controller of choice on your PC. That's or, if you're all about original hardware and you really want to play GoldenEye, what you could do, and I only learned about this recently, is you could plug two uh, N64 pads in <laughs> yeah. and use one of each of the analog sticks. <laughs> I tried that once and it felt a lot of fun. One is your left stick, pad two is your right. 
It, yeah. yeah, it's it's wonky as hell. It is the most ghetto solution going. Or as of a few weeks ago, you can uh, get that Xbox port. Oh, yeah. Sorry, go on, Paula. I am pretty sure there are like third party controllers for the Nintendo 64 that yeah. either came out recently or are in development. I don't remember. But the, like that have like two analog sticks or are like better than whatever the N64 controller was trying to be. <laughs> Hell, there are wireless yeah, not N64 controllers now for your original hardware. Like it's yeah. that scene's that scene's getting bit. Um anyway, why don't we um why don't we, we what was there something else Sorry, I was going to say? I didn't, oh yeah, yeah. I didn't actually. Answer, I didn't answer my my oh, question yes. myself with my statements. Oh, oh please. Um, <laughs> so for me, it's it's kind of like like all of you said. I uh, I judge with my modern perspective, but with context. And I do like to, as I mentioned earlier, play like the entire series of something to get that context too, and also kind of put myself more in that mindset of okay, I just played the first one. Now I'm moving to the second one, and you can kind of emulate the experience of being there at that time, right? Because the context is important. Um, but if it doesn't meet a certain threshold of of modern comfort, I won't even touch it. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the East series is a good example because uh, East 1 and 2 came out on, like, some of those uh, old computer systems like the uh, X68000 and some of those J Japan only releases. And there was a NES version, maybe a TurboGrafx-16 version or something, but they're like pretty primitive. Um, and that's a little bit too primitive for me nowadays, but there's a PSP remake of one and two. So I jumped on that. And then from three onwards, you know, they were modern enough to, uh, to play no problem. But like with the Persona series, for example, my entry point was Persona 3, portable on the PSP, which was great. And I can go forward from there. Like I just beat Persona 4, Golden. Definitely got five in the backlog. It's on the shelf. Um, but will I go back and play 1 and 2 and like the PSP different versions too? I don't think I will just because I don't think they hold up enough to warrant the, the hours of playtime. So it's a mix. Like I try to pre-review games before I even decide if I want to play them or not. Just to make sure I'm only playing good games that still at least hold up to some level. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, I kind of know that they're not going to going in and try to um, have more of like a historical critics mindset when I go in. And it's kind of just for my own weird <laughs> desire to experience <laughs> it. But um, but in general, yeah, it's, it's mostly does it hold up for me. I, I try to evaluate it in that regard. And on my, you know, my blog, I tend to write a lot of reviews just from that mindset, you know, I, I don't, I don't give it too much slack for releasing in 1998 or whatever. So hmm. that's my take, man. Nice. Yeah, and, and the personas are, re are weird in the first three, so one and, and the the two duology are so different to Persona Three onwards, as you could almost consider them their own yeah. spin-off series. That's the thing too; they they look and they feel different. Like Persona Three on, it's very much like modern Persona. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, the, the structure, the art style, like the music, everything just feels cohesive. I mean, I know a lot of the characters and the, the, the persona themselves or the demons in the greater Shin Megami Tensei series are, are consistent and like the weird spell names and stuff. But like the real feel of it. Yeah. Oh, man. Every time I go back to a persona, I'm like, what the fuck is Mabufu La? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> what does that one do? <laughs> oh, that shit is yeah. just second nature now. Um, well, yeah, now it is. But yeah, it's, it's a real. <laughs> one, th one more just quickly before we move on. Uh, there is a rare breed of game that's considered better now than it was at the time. And I think the poster child for this is Alien Resurrection for the PS1. In other words, the game that pioneered twin stick um, FPS controls. But it, I'm getting blank looks all around. None of you will know about this, right? Nope. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> sure, Rick. <laughs> it, 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 was, it was like a, an alien IP game. Um, it wasn't released at time with any of the films, I don't think. I think it was initially planned to, but then it got delayed to sort of get it right. And um, it has what most people sort of consider to have been popularized by Halo, which is the, the forward, back, left, right um, on the left stick, um, or strafe left and right, rather, and then look left, right, up and down on your right stick. It, it had those controls. I think it was like 99 or 2000. Um, and the critics hated it because it was new and they couldn't get their heads around it. But then obviously you fast forward five, 10 years, that is the way 
to control a first person shooter on a pad. Nice. And uh, assuming you can get past the the technical foibles in in the sense that it's it's polygonal 3D. <laughs> excuse me, in the most primitive of senses, the, the actual gameplay and, and the mechanics and the controls um, hold up really well. It's, it's one I plan to play properly. I've, I've dabbled very, very briefly with it on an emulator. Um, and, and with a, a sort of a, a, a visual upgrade, you, you would be forgiven for thinking it was a game that was developed in the past five years, not 20 years ago, uh, like an indie project sort of thing, rather than uh, like a really, really old PS1 game. Um, well, to be fair, a lot of modern indie, that's like fashionable right now, is targeting the early PS1, you know, games like Dusk, for example, those kind of old 3D uh, aesthetic. Yeah. That's like a whole aesthetic now, you know? It's like the step beyond retro, like a, 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 an era of gaming becomes indie. There you go. <laughs> um, right, should we, yeah. uh, should we finish off with the game? We haven't said it together. Let's all try it. How, How long, long to do it? The game. The game. <laughs> nice. And as always, it was you guys a train are messing up wreck. on purpose. That's got to be on try. I it's wish really I could, not. I wish what? I could say it was. This is <laughs> this is genuine effort. There's so much. Um, I wonder right. how much delay is between our beats here. It is. Yeah. Hey, um, <laughs> I've got it up, so I'm I'm ready to go. Sorry. Can go I on. make a quick request? Can we can we go back to saying them uh, out loud again? I really miss uh, all of us trying to like figure it out together, and I feel like it works really well when we <laughs> listen to it. Um, because lately we've just been typing it, and I I miss that. That adds an extra wrinkle to the game, you know. For you, of course. Thank you. Um, great. So what's uh, so wait? We'll lead in. So what's the game, Rick? It is drum roll, please. Oh, that's a DLC. Let's try again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice. It is a game called The Final Station. What? The hmm. what? Can I find I, a friend? I <laughs> actually own this game, and I'm yet to play it. It's an indie game. It's a little bit like Snowpiercer. Like it's post-apocalyptic. You're stuck on a train. Can you tell me what system it's on? At least PC. I don't know how many. Hints it's PC. on PC. It doesn't mean anything. And yeah. the Switch. I, <laughs> oh, it's a Switch game. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, you're allowed to Google it. You're just not allowed to look for times. So if, oh. if you want to go find screenshots or whatever. Um, mm. So it's called it the, the final station. The final station. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, Hopefully, first... long to be doesn't come up in the search results. Usually doesn't. Um, yeah. <laughs> or if it did, you'd have to click through for it to pop through. I yeah. um I have a rough idea of what I think this is, so I'm going to wait for you three to to commit yourselves before I say anything. I didn't want to. I didn't want to look too hard just to make it more more pure of a game. But can you refresh my memory on? I have the option to guess different parts or not, right? Or does it yeah. matter because I'm a guest or what? Yeah, so you, you there's three times to guess. Main, main plus, 100%. Um, and you can guess as many or as few of those as you'd like. Um, if you guess only one time, it has to be within one hour. If you guess two times, they have to be within three hours. Um, and if you guess all three times, then you have a five-hour leeway. The I idea see. being that there's a risk-reward with, with sort of going for more times. So if I'm not confident, I really should only make one guess, right? Uh, or if you if you're not confident, but you're like you want to sort of hedge your bets on a range, you should hail Mary all three. Because mm. you get a lot okay. of leeway if you do all three, which I think is where I'm heading for this one here. <laughs> yeah, because uh, yeah, this game, like just so people who are listening get a sense here, it's a single player side scrolling shooter video game with train simulator and exploration elements. You're basically like have this train and you're trying to like keep people alive on it, and then also shooting. Um. So I uh, see. Hmm. I've seen the hint that it was critiqued for its linearity, which like gives me a slight idea here. Um, on this, I'm like most games that are critiqued for that usually aren't like ginormous fucking things. But I don't know. <laughs> um, let me see. So I, I'm there gonna go. A... Oh, Paula, did you have an idea? It's a player will need to find a hidden code at each station to get the train moving again and also find resources such as ammo, food, and survivors. Mm. Do you like have a train with survivors? I would just say it's a bit like Snowpiercer. If anyone's seen that film. And if you haven't, you should because it's a really good film. Yeah. It's like the Hunger Games on the train. It's the Hunger Trains. Except there's only one train, so it's like the Hunger Train. The Hunger Train. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. How long?
long do I think this is? How long do indie games go these days? <laughs> wow. uh, I mean, it depends. Is it procedural or handcrafted? Because it seems I handcrafted. <laughs> hmm. I didn't realize you guys did all this research before you guessed on the. We don't always. I'm... No, normally, we have a better idea collectively of what the game is about. Yeah, this is just okay. such a game that we've never seen that it's like, yeah, I need to friggin' figure this out. Um... I think I'm gonna go with the three times. Oh, okay. Are go on, all right. What are your times, Paula? I said I would go with it. Now that I knew what those times were. Oh, ha, ha, ha. This is I'm a hard. I'm gonna have to hurry. Yeah. yeah all right. Well, the really. Uh, I'm gonna go for six hours for main because what the hell? Worst ball awards. You know how to write, I think. <laughs> Question mark. Question so, mark. Main six hours. Uh, main plus. I don't know yet. I'm just writing things. Yeah. There are five chapters in this game, so I'm figuring there's that no way. That feels like too much research. What are you talking about? That's the, <laughs> yeah. that's, the, that's fine by me. You, <laughs> can, you can learn as much as you want about how long the game is. <laughs> you, you're going to play this yeah. game. You actually know this one. <laughs> yeah. The keyword being going to. Yeah, that's fair. I'm just going to say. But that's just, to me, was- it makes me think that the shortest the game could be would be five hours, right? Like that's that's what I'm thinking would be the shortest. Um, unless okay. I'm crazy wrong and maybe each chapter is like half an hour, <laughs> which I'm screwed. I think I'm ready to guess just totally based on nothing but gut. All right. Go ahead. Main, 12 hours. Okay. Ooh. 12. Uh-huh. Hot take. Main, main plus 13 hours. Oh. Mm-hmm. 100%. Any predictions? I'm just going to see this is the issue. 14. Okay. Yeah. Nice. This is the issue is that like the main plus often in the completion, completion can sometimes go like crazy high, you know? Um, I'm going to do main. Yeah, if, there's some makes, if there's some achievement that makes it, you have to replay the game 10 times, you know, then yeah. something stupid like that. Is that the hundred percent? Yeah. I'm going to do main eight hours. Uh, main plus 12 hours, I think. I think I'm going to stick there. What about you, Rick? Interesting. Wow. What I've said is main five hours, main plus eight hours. I do think this is a little bit on the shorter side. Plus eight. Oh, God. See, now I have to do, I have to question myself about do I switch or do I add a 100%? Um, I'm going to add a 100%. Um, oh, okay. Just to save myself. Yeah. So I won't, I won't switch up. I'm going to add a 100 and I'm going to put that 100 at at thir- no at hmm, how, how many hours do I want to put it at? I think I'm going to lower my time a little bit to uh, main plus eight and 100 percent ten because okay. if it was well, criticized by linearity, then may 100 percent may not be as like too too much more than main. That's why I did a tight spread. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm going to put 13. Um, 13, that's 11. 100%. All right. Okay. Check those times. I don't think you want to change anything last minute, and then uh, we'll reveal all. Reveal it, good sir. Wait, I'm going to. Oh, wait, Paula. There. Ricky didn't do 100%? No, I didn't. I'm uh, I'm going to go for that, that two time. I'm not confident on the 100. Right then, let's find out. I think I've done it, you know. Let's main see. story four and a half hours <sighs> main story plus five and a half hours I'm a yes i've just done it uh completion is six and a half hours damn so you're, right, you're, right you're right for a tight spread dude you're right for a tight spread you just yeah you started uh, to try out. subtract seven from all of my numbers i think i think um i think both you and paula got it yeah um oh Yes, you might be right. So Hang on, I've, I've completed. Rick's got 23 yes, and Paula's got 15 now. Yeah. Yes, because she has the five hour split. Which means yes, she's tied with me. Nice. <laughs> Should have listened to my <laughs> gut on that linearity. Mm. The comeback's on, and our, our guests are still flagging behind on zero points. Um, I did not expect to get any points to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's a really hard game. <laughs> it is a hard really game, hard. right? It's tough. Um, all right. Well, thank you, you so much. Um, <laughs> 
Ian, for joining us this week. And everyone, you're probably, as I'm speaking now, you're about to start hearing Ian's wonderful music as he's created all of the music for the How Long to Beat podcast. So see you next week, everybody. And thank you. Bye. Thanks for having me.